This is Free Speech Radio News for July the 4th, 2011. Unprecedented pro-democracy revolutions have gripped the Middle East and North Africa since December. Popularly known as the Arab Awakenings or Arab Spring, these revolts have been led by Arab youth aged 18 to 30 who make up the largest age group in the Arab world. From the outset, these youth-driven protest movements included a strong musical component, and Arab hip-hop is one of the most powerful forms of music to emerge during these revolutions. Stay tuned for Rhymes and Revolution, soundtrack to the Arab Spring, a special FSRN documentary produced by Jackson Allers. In December 2010, a 26-year-old Tunisian street vendor named Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire in a small town south of the Tunisian capital. His family said he was protesting the confiscation of his vegetable cart and his assault at the hands of local officials. Bouazizi's act of desperation and his death set off an unprecedented series of pro-democracy uprisings in the Arab world that helped topple the decades-old regimes in Tunisia and Egypt, ultimately spreading to more bloody democracy struggles in Libya, Bahrain, Yemen, and Syria. Rushdi, a Tunisian protester in Bouazizi's hometown of Sid Bouazid, spoke to Al Jazeera in late January after the fall of the 23-year regime of Tunisia's president, Ben Ali. Our protests began with demands to address social issues like unemployment, but now we have added to these demands issues of freedom, democracy, fighting corruption, and holding officials accountable. As the revolutions intensified, music echoing the sentiments of the protesters became more prolific, and the most iconic music being made about these movements came from a musical genre that had spent the better part of 15 years developing in the shadows of revolution, Arab hip-hop. Angie Nassar is a journalist and prominent cultural blogger from Beirut, Lebanon. Hip-hop is, is made to sort of narrate the experiences of people who've been oppressed or marginalized. It's something that, it's a sort of easy platform for resistance in a way because it gives a voice to people who don't have one. In terms of the Arab Spring and what's happening in the region, it certainly is a good vehicle for people to express what's going on in their own words outside of mainstream media. Even before Bouazizi committed his act of self-immolation, a 21-year-old Tunisian rapper, Hamada Ben Amour, also known as El General, was busy writing songs about the corruption of the Tunisian regime. His song, Rais le Bled, Head of State, was a direct condemnation of the Tunisian president. But as the song hints, El General was fully aware of the risks when speaking out against the regime, as one line reads, quote, it could cost him his head. Under the state of emergency Ben Ali used to control Tunisia, criticism of the regime was tantamount to treason. Angie Nassar said the risk El General took in making his regime critical music is something largely lost on Western audiences. I don't think a lot of people understand that. I think they underestimate or don't realize how difficult it is to come out and be very specific about um, the circumstances that are oppressing people because you could get killed. You could get thrown in jail. Your family could get thrown in jail. You could get tortured. To get his music beyond the Tunisian censors, El General posted videos on Facebook and YouTube. And shortly after Bouazizi set himself on fire in December, El General released a second song called Tunisia Our Country, which led to his arrest and detention. The public rallied around El General at the height of the anti-government protests in Tunis, and three days later he was released to a hero's welcome. By that time, revolution had spread to Egypt, and El General's song, Head of State, became an anthem for the revolutions. Then they fight you. Then you win. I heard him say the revolution won't be televised. El Jazeera proved him wrong. Twitter has him paralyzed. 80 million strong and ain't no longer gonna be terrorized. Organized, mobilized, vocalized. On the side of truth. As the revolts took root from Libya to Bahrain, Songs in both Arabic and English were spreading from mobile phone to mobile phone by the thousands. And it was this use of technology that characterized the successful fomenting of revolutions all over the region. Munir Habala is the program coordinator of the Youth Research Program at American University of Beirut's Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs. 
She said that while Facebook, Twitter, and the other social networking methods certainly played a key organizing role, television and mobile phone technology had the most galvanizing effects. The technology helped the idea move faster, but it's not why the idea was spread. Unprecedented citizen journalism offered a near constant stream of protest images from cell phones and cameras that even the most censored states like Bahrain and Syria could not suppress. These images influenced how the Arab media portrayed the events in Tunisia, likely making the difference where public opinion was concerned. Again, Munira Hobala. Something that people are considering is how Al Jazeera framed what happened in Tunisia, Bouazizi's death. So we've seen other instances in the Arab world where people have done such things and the way that it was framed was very different. Usually it's like youth are, uh, they're probably on drugs, this is why they're acting this way, they're acting out. But this time they chose to frame it in a way that it was a revolutionary thing, that he just wanted dignity, they even like, you know, I mean, this, the conditions that most youth are living in, or in most people, I, I don't want to say just youth, most people have been living in, in this part of the world, it's inhuman. And I think one of the most impressive things that happened during the revolution is that people were coming out and calling for these things, and we know that it wasn't something that was coming from the West. Youth under 30 make up the largest age group in the 22 Arab-speaking countries. This segment of the population grew up amid rampant unemployment, a lack of democratic rights, and in many cases only one leader. But they also grew up being influenced by pop culture, both from the West and locally. While mainstream American hip-hop was increasingly a part of that musical diet, young people throughout the Arab world were also exposed to the more traditional forms of their parents' musical fare. Twenty-year-old Egyptian protester Rawan Darwish says before the uprising, she was convinced the country was losing its creative soul. She was in Cairo's Tahrir Square at the height of the Egyptian revolution. Why was no one expressing themselves? Why were we so repressed, suffocated, and angry? Before the revolutions, I wondered where the music was. In the 70s, our movies were so nice, our music was so beautiful, our writers wrote beautifully. I didn't think people understood beauty anymore. In Egypt from the 1940s to the 1970s, four iconic singers emerged to define the sentiments of Arab thought both politically and socially at a time of strong Arab nationalism. The diva Um Kulthum, singer-actor Abdel Halim Hafez, and singer-composers Farid Al-Atrash and Mohammed Abdel Wahab. Later, Lebanese diva Fairuz, with her composer son Ziad Rahbani, also added to the canon and helped define musical subject matter for three generations of Arab music lovers and revolutionaries. The music coming out of the uprisings blended the poetic traditions that had always been a part of dissident Arab thought with old and new musical compositions. Use of colloquial Arabic became more widespread in poetic verse, and like the Tunisian rapper El General, poets and composers in countries throughout the Arab world went to jail for protesting their governments in song. People like Egyptian poets Abdul Rahman Abdudi and Ahmad Fouad Nejim and singer Sheikh Imam. <laughs> Places like Tahrir Square in Cairo and the Pearl Roundabout in Bahrain's capital Manama became the rallying points for musicians and protesters alike. Rawan Darwish said the festive musical atmosphere in Tahrir Square helped coax her out onto the streets to protest. Before Mubarak fell, a girl introduced me to the protesters. I watched them chant and sing and told them what they're doing would not lead to anything, that they're risking getting hit for nothing, that nobody would hear their voices. I was more hopeful when I saw what was going on in Tunisia, and I started thinking, if they made it happen, maybe we could as well. For the burgeoning Arab hip-hop movement, the revolutions provided a forum for a new generation of musicians who had barely scratched the surface of mass appeal, 
and their message was far from the Arabic pop fare that dominated radio airwaves. Johnny Mad Nasser, known by his alias Johnny Damascus, is a longtime fixture in the Arab hip hop scene. Bassist and co founder of the Lebanese live hip hop group Fariel Atrash, Nasser said the Arab b boys used the revolutions to expand their circle of influence to young and old who had never been exposed to the music before. One thing that, that my crew did is that we were featured on the most mainstream uh, television show possible, I think, at the time when the revolutions were, were just first igniting and when they had succeeded already in Egypt and Tunisia. Is uh, We got up on a show called Arab's Got Talent, which is the, you know, the equivalent of uh, Britain's Got Talent or America's Got Talent or what have you. And we came up and we did the full-on like, public enemy treatment, if you, if you may, for like, the status of, of our, like, the state of the Arab nation. And... Edward uh, Abbas, Ed, he just came out straight up and he named names. He said all sorts of critical and, and quite nasty things about them, like right up live all over the Arab world in countries that may still support those dictators at the time. And I think that we, we came out there and we, we put our two cents in and the judges at the show extolled, you know, the virtue of us being the first song where in the entire Arabic language where the names of these people were actually brought up. Mainstream television was not the place where Arab hip-hop was taking root. It was happening in underground clubs, street parties, and schoolyards, the places where Arab hip-hop first took root in France in the mid-1990s. While the origins of Arab hip-hop are disputed, there's general agreement that North African Arabs living in France were the first to represent Arab hip-hop in the music industry. France, the epicenter of European hip-hop and the world's second-largest hip-hop market, was home to a large population of Arab emigres from its former North African colonies, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. French hip-hop groups in the 1990s like the Super Cyan Crew and I Am all had Arab members. Despite the Arab influence, most of the hip-hop being produced and disseminated in North Africa in the 1990s was in French. While it garnered a small fan base in Morocco and Algeria, Early Arab hip-hop failed to make a dent in other Arab markets due to the language barrier. American hip-hop was a larger influence over the Arab music market in the 1990s, in large part because of one rapper that, like the boxer Muhammad Ali before him, galvanized the disenfranchised through his messaging. In elementary. Hey, I see the penitentiary. One day, the Tupac Amaru Shakur, better known as Tupac, rapped about violence and hardship in the inner city, as well as racism and other social problems that resonated with Arab youth more than any other rapper before him. Beirut-based hip-hop scholar and blogger Angie Nassar said that rappers in the Arab world tend to be drawn to lyrical content over the music. Who are your musical influences? Who do you listen to? And they said, that's not important. It doesn't matter because it's really not about the music. It's about the message. And that's such a powerful thing. And it sort of makes you realize, it, it takes you back to what hip hop was all about in the very beginning, 1970s, South Bronx, New York, black urban youth who were marginalized socioeconomically and wanted as citizens. The only tools that they had was coming together in this communal sort of uh, way to express themselves. It's a powerful thing, especially in a region where people don't have a voice, where people aren't allowed to say what they really want to say. Being able to do that through hip hop is incredibly powerful. The Arab world's most diverse and perhaps most vibrant hip hop scene can be found in Lebanon. Here, the hip hop narrative has focused on the sectarian system that defines the country's political and social life. You're listening to the song Thawra, or Revolution, by the Lebanese rapper Rice Beck. In the late 1990s, he and his group Access Ser, or No Access, became the first Arab group in the Middle East to release an album in spoken Arabic. Like other rap acts that emerged in Lebanon after the devastating 1975 to 1990 civil war, the group spoke about the varied political and social elements of life in Lebanon, its crises, its wars, and its historically liberal nightlife. You have to know that in Lebanon there is 18 confessions. Uh, people are not united. It's a sectarian country. 
what we are trying to do is a secular country where religion is separated from politics. And this is when I recorded the people shouting a shab you read Scott and Nizam. The word they were shouting, it's the same words they were shouting in Egypt, Tunisia and everywhere and in Bahrain, everywhere in the Arab world. A shab you read Scott and Nizam means the people are demanding the end of the regime, of this system, of this regime. The fractured nature of Lebanon's political system means that when these divisions explode into violence, Lebanese civil society is pulled into conflict. A power-sharing deal signed in 2008 has helped to maintain more than three years of peace, and Lebanon's rap scene has flourished as a result. Rappers have gained traction with the Lebanese youth, particularly with the growing anti-sectarian struggle that was given new significance after the Arab uprisings began. But, as John Nasser explains, the country's more liberal freedom of speech laws don't imply carte blanche for the Lebanese rappers. Fighting the, sec- the, uh, the sectarian system that we have in place, it's not so much about removing one dictator in power, but rather 20 different dictators that split up a pie and created a situation where you have more freedom here. But it's also kind of like a glass ceiling of freedom that you can't go beyond. Certain human rights issues can't be, you know, can't be touched upon or improved. Certain... Uh, you know, uh, citizens' rights can't be uh, transgressed, you know, in terms of, let's say, intersectarian marriage or in terms of, let's say, the, the domestic workers that's, um, that's almost comparable to slavery. Like, there's certain things that you can't talk about in the media or they just won't let you bring them up or they bring them up with lip service. The regional rap movement that perhaps had the most influence on Arab hip-hop comes from the place that gave rise to the most intractable conflict in the Arab world the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. For more than six decades, Palestinian artists and musicians have resisted Israeli occupation, and the younger generation made hip-hop part of this artistic renaissance. Again, hip-hop scholar Angie Nasser. Certainly, I think the Palestinian movement in hip-hop has an influence on the hip-hoppers and the rest of the region. They can connect with that idea of resistance and being in a situation where you're not happy and there are few resources to express that. Under Hosni Mubarak's 30-year rule, official censorship was something that inhibited Egypt's artistic and cultural life and gagged the media. All of that changed when millions took to the streets in Egypt to challenge his rule. One prominent member of the Egyptian hip-hop scene, rapper Mohamed El-Dib, known as Dib, took part in the protests in Cairo's Tahrir Square. Like other rappers in Egypt, MC Deeb was used to rhyming in metaphors to decry the system. He was inspired by the Egyptian youth who proved they were willing to sacrifice their bodies to topple the Mubarak regime. Some 850 died in the near three weeks of nationwide protests, with over 6,000 wounded. Historically, hip-hop in Egypt was late to develop, in large part because of the atmosphere of artistic censorship. Around 2005, that started to change, explains Karim Adel, a.k.a. Rush, one of the founding members of Arabian Nights, Egypt's most well-known hip-hop group. He offered an alternative explanation about why hip-hop was destined to take root in Egypt. Okay, first of all, uh, the culture here in Arabia is not that far away from poetry. Rap is rhythm and poetry at the end of the day, so we really uh, appreciated lyrical content from, from way back, from even pre-Islamic era, when poets used to just go to Su'a Oqaz in, uh, in the Gulf area and they just used to battle, you know, so uh, that whole concept of battle and lyric, lyricism and freestyling and um, poetry in general is not that new for us as, as Arabs. Uh, the, so when we saw it happening on music in America, and especially that it started off in America as struggle music, Every Arab nation has its own struggle. So it was easily appreciated and accepted by the Arab youth more than the Arab old, old people who just are resistant to anything new, basically. And we did hear uh, rappers from Palestine and Lebanon doing it first and uh, w- with their own accents of Arabic and their own versions of Arabic. And we really thought, like, yeah, we can do this too. Rebel, 
This Arabian night song, Rebel, was released after the start of the Egyptian revolution. The video has since garnered more than 200,000 views, making Rebel one of Egypt's musical anthems. But Rush is ambitious with his plans for the Egyptian hip-hop scene. His goal? To get the Arabian Nights' music on the download sites of the masses, the so-called shabby websites that millions of Arabs rely on for their cell phone ringtones and MP3s. I already have a, uh, the first single on our album is go, uh, that's, that we're going to make a video for. It's called El Moulid, and it's, it's featuring one of the major stars in the shabby scene, which is going to put us more into the microbus scene as well that we can't even reach through a street scene. Let me tell you this. The, the, the song leaked already, and I don't even ha know how it leaked. It leaked on the forums that the shabby people download all the music from, which I don't even know what these sites are. Only these people know about it. And these people are a lot in Egypt, by the way. They're like, we're talking about millions of people. So uh, we, we, we just can't wait to shoot the video and put it out for the masses to, to, to watch because this song is not only going to be hip enough for the microbus scene, it's going to be playing in weddings. It's going to be playing in posh clubs. It's going to be playing in hip-hop clubs. Tunisia and Egypt are in the midst of post-revolution struggles for power. Reports have surfaced claiming that elements of the deposed Tunisian regime are finding their way back to power. And in Egypt, some 10,000 secret military trials have taken place since the fall of Mubarak. Research fellow Munira Habala from the American University of Beirut. That's probably one of the most depressing things post-revolution is because you see how much you know people put themselves out there and have this high-risk risk activism, and with so much, so many expectations. I think it's pretty obvious that the problem is bigger than just the what the leaders can do or what the people can try to force the leaders to do. So I really don't see in the near future that much change. The uprisings in Libya, Bahrain, Yemen and Syria have gotten more bloody over the last five months and while the Western powers have orchestrated a NATO-led military intervention in Libya, no such response has occurred in Bahrain, Yemen or Syria. These continued struggles have managed to help get the revolutionary messaging of Arab hip-hoppers like El General and the Arabian Nights on Arab satellite television music channels when they had never before been considered for broadcast. Laith Majali, as a documentary photographer and filmmaker, has been documenting the Arab hip-hop movement for the last four years. For me, it was either two ways. It was either hip-hop in the Arab world will get known because of some pop producer finding one MC and making him a star, or it's going to be through something like what happened, you know. And I was quite glad that that's how hip-hop in the Arab world now is getting all of this interest. Uh, even internationally, people are looking at hip-hop and its contribution to uh, the revolutions and what's happening in the Arab world. So I really think uh, hip-hop did have something to play in it. DJ Lethal Skills. <laughs> There is still more work to be done in the uprisings. Populations clamoring for democracy must also tackle issues of social inequality, and no one can explain that more than Malika, the only prominent female MC living in the Arab world. I was in a TV show not a long time ago, and I was competing with 14 other guys, and I was supposed to win, and the whole world knows that I was supposed to win, but yet I couldn't win just because I was a girl. It wasn't acceptable for them for a girl to win over 15 or 14 men and that really hurt me that was like the only time where I really felt the difference between the woman and the men in the Arab world that was like for us here being a female MC means that we have to work double and and put twice as much effort to to earn the respect and to prove that no we really have a cause we really have a message and ever since I made sure that I don't want to only be on the level of the other male MCs. I want to be even better. At the end of the day, many forms of creative expression emerged during the revolutions, but Arab hip-hop took on international collaborations like never before. This inevitably shed more Western attention on Arab hip-hop. 
and the Arab rap diaspora became the ambassadors for the Arab hip hop movement in the West. This song, hashtag January 25, received over 300,000 views after its release during the Egyptian Revolution, a reference to both the date the protest began in Egypt and its prominence as a trending topic on Twitter. Iraqi Canadian rapper The Narcissist collaborated with other MCs from the Arabic rap diaspora in North America and Canada. It wasn't really about Egypt. It was about a people standing up against their government and, and overthrowing the government, you know? You would see it on all the news networks, but also you would see it on websites that wouldn't necessarily cover things in the Middle East, usually. It was important, man. It was important to show the people that we were standing with them, even though we were all the way across the world. At the same time, I think it was an example to the West of like, you know, Arabs can do it on their own. They don't need your help. But is Arab hip-hop really affecting the Arab street like other past revolutionary musical forms? At least in Libya, in the rebel-held eastern parts of the country, local hip-hop has become a primary soundtrack to the revolution. <laughs> Despite NATO air cover, the pro-Qaddafi forces continue to outmatch rebel fighters on the ground. For young Libyans like 24-year-old Yusuf al-Briki, rap has become their weapon against Qaddafi. Freelance radio reporter Ben Gilbert went to Libya in April during the height of the fighting. He met al-Briki in the official media center of the rebel-held capital Benghazi. And this guy's name is Swat. And he was a kid who, he was basically from the ghetto of Benghazi. Um, and growing up on the streets, said that his two main influences were, uh, were Tupac and Eminem. SWAT started the crew Revolution Beat with Islam Winez, a.k.a. AZ, and they've joined a host of other young rapper upstarts trying to capitalize on the newly found freedom of speech in rebel-held territory. Reporter Ben Gilbert said it has cemented hip-hop's relevance in Libya. Clearly, hip-hop had become an influence in the revolution and embraced clearly by kind of the establishment of the revolution by giving musicians, including kids who are into hip hop and rap, office space in, in kind of their formal media building. If chanting was important in Tahrir Square, it seems like music uh, was, was kind of the chanting of, uh, of the Libyan revolution and hip hop was included in that. <laughs> The original creators of hip-hop developed an art form as an expression of the unique realities of a marginalized U.S. urban experience. But the formula they crafted, a mix of wordplay, beats, and samples of musical heritage, has resonated among populations from different backgrounds and different locales. Just how this creative expression can translate into a broader youth-led push for social change in the Arab world remains to be seen. But Beirut blogger and hip-hop scholar Angie Nasser says the potential for change through popular movements is ripe at the moment. She also says she's unconvinced that a unified conception of Arab hip-hop will emerge. If ever there was a time for lots of people to start connecting with an idea of exactly carving out a new space for yourself, giving yourself agency, becoming practical cultural producers, this is the time. Whoever thought that, that the people of Tunisia would take to the streets and have a revolution and overthrow their dictator, and the same thing goes for Egypt, this could easily be the soundtrack to the revolution. Today's documentary, Rhymes and Revolution, Soundtrack to the Arab Spring, was produced by Jackson Allers and edited by Shannon Young. Rose Katapchi provided technical production assistance. This documentary was made possible by the Spot.us crowdfunding community and by FSRN listener donors. You can find this and other FSRN documentaries online at our website, fsrn.org. We'll be back tomorrow with our regular newscast. Thanks for listening. In San Francisco, I'm Danny Wood.